is at a time when over loose monetary policies are pushing up prices sharply. Some of us have witnessed this toxic cocktail before. The man in charge was called Heath. <laughs> Those who have not witnessed it before will become especially disillusioned. Regrettably, in our absence, many of the benefits that should have accrued from Brexit have not yet materialised. The Northern Ireland Protocol is a toxic concoction which threatens the very integrity of the United Kingdom. Regrettably, one comes to the conclusion that the European Union and the President of the United States seem to be covertly trying to advance the concept of a united Ireland. If that is not their intention, now is the time, before the situation deteriorates further, to back the required changes to that protocol. Our own government has been regrettably slow to realise the full benefits of Brexit. Our fishing industry is in disarray. And does Boris not realise that massive increases in corporation tax and national insurance will make it far less attractive to invest and recruit in Britain? We are also decarbonising on a whim. I'll leave you to guess on whose whim it is. <laughs> we are decarbonising on a whim without any thought as to what might happen if there is no wind or if gas supplies are disrupted. Many people voted for Brexit to reduce unskilled immigration. But where, oh where, is the plan to encourage and incentivise British workers to take up the slack? Where is it? Isn't that what levelling up should be all about? Now today, ladies and gentlemen, we have four speakers who can enunciate the difficulties which we face and the opportunities that await much better than I. Firstly, we have the two Conservative members of Parliament who could not bring themselves to vote for the withdrawal agreement from the European Union when it was brought before Parliament. In particular, they foresaw the threat that the Northern Ireland Protocol posed to the integrity of the United Kingdom. They also foresaw the damage that would be imposed upon our fishing industry and the hard-working men and women that are employed therein. They could also not understand why we had to pay £40 billion for this one-sided agreement. Yeah. Now the first to speak today will be the Right Honourable Owen Paterson MP, Member of Parliament for North Shropshire, and formerly the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. Owen, over the last 18 months, you have often been in our thoughts. Our admiration and respect for you has risen accordingly. We welcome you here today, and I'm sure that everyone wishes to give you the reception which you deserve. Ladies and gentlemen, Owen Patterson.
Honourable Baron, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction. This is actually the first time I've spoken in public since my wife's suicide in June last year. Uh, I'd like to thank many of you here uh, and on the panel who've written me uh, wonderful letters, emails, telephone calls of sympathy. I really appreciate that support through that time. Um, but I thought I should come along today, at least get back on the horse. Uh, and I'm very proud to be standing in front of you wearing my Spartan's tie. <laughs> and, uh, one of my 28 MPs who would not vote for the deals in the posteries, which would have thwarted the democratic voice of 17.4 million people. And I felt very strongly we had Spartans dinner last week, and quite clear some people had a real struggle. I actually remember thinking it was pretty simple. I thought there would be just such a shattering loss of confidence in the whole political system if the metropolitan establishment had ganged up and thwarted those 17.4 million. So I'm very proud to stand here, and uh, John's very modest. He's not wearing really Spartans tie, but John and I also have a special category, which uh, I call a Hotlines. <laughs> and, and we didn't vote for the final deal. We discussed it, we hummed and hard, we felt we really couldn't vote against. We'd be letting people like you down, and I have to pay credit to all the work you and the British have done over the years, getting us to where we were <laughs> and giving the ammunition to the 17.4 million. But I couldn't vote for a constitutional act which would have separated a part of the United Kingdom, which only quite recently, following the negotiations and following the skill, skillful work of David Trimble, had voted very, very firmly to stay in the United Kingdom. And I, as John kind of said, I was uh, Secretary Secretary for two years, I was the uh, Shadow Secretary for three years, and I still go to Northern Ireland on a pretty regular basis. And the Northern Ireland Protocol is wrong. It is absolutely wrong that all of us here who supported Brexit, we never ever dreamt of hiding off a part of the United Kingdom. And it was built around a totally bogus argument about the dangers of the border. There is a border this afternoon. There is a currency border. There's a VAT border. There's an excise duty border. And it all works perfectly satisfactorily with modern electronic means. So huge international companies like Diageo, uh, like Thales, that run what's called like Patrick, used to be one of the dairies. 80% of their milk comes from Northern Ireland. It's the same milk from the same cows, on the same farm, in the same truck, on the same road, to the same dairy, every day, and nobody knows it. It's all done quite satisfactorily. This whole issue of the border, which represents 0.02% of the UK GDP, the sales that are it's 5% of Northern Ireland sales, it's only about 6% of the Republic of Ireland sales, or was, of course, until we had trade diversion. That was all, all used as a totally bogus reason for trying to keep the UK somehow within a single market and the European Union. And I'm now seriously concerned with the damage it's doing. There's absolutely no doubt it's doing economic damage. I talk to Northern businesses on a regular place. I work with two, two big ones. But there's absolutely no doubt that our goods that cannot be sourced from GB, uh, there's absolutely no doubt that it's causing political unrest. It's now, as David Frost said this morning, which I talked to my minister, he says the cross community support has collapsed. Uh, Jeffrey Donaldson is talking about crashing the, uh, the institutions and bringing them down. Uh, and there's no doubt at all, it's only thanks to the skill of the three unit leaders, um, Jeffrey, uh, Jim Alston, that's all last week, and Doug Beatty, that they have bluntly kept control of it. I don't think they will manage that over a sustained period because it is absolutely unacceptable in a modern, sophisticated, educated society for laws to be imposed on people by a distant bureaucracy where they cannot vote for a single person. 
who could help initiate those laws or amend those laws, or much more broadly, repeal them. So 800 laws have been imposed on the citizens of the United Kingdom in theory, but these are European laws. There's been no discussion in any democratic institution anywhere within the UK, and there's absolutely no one to whom they can go for any sort of relief. And if it didn't go to any court, it would be a European court where we have absolutely no representation. That is simply not sustainable. Yeah, and it is not good enough for the Remainers to say, this is your bucket of cold sick, suck it up. That is a very stupid way to run any form of arrangement. And it is clearly not working. I think David Frost and Ellis has manfully tried to make it work. He's gone back with numerous papers to the European Union, and they simply, have, they simply haven't replied. He's been rebuffed. So it is welcome that today, this morning, he said, on my scrappy notes, he said, we will need to act, and we will trigger Article 16. Because there's a bigger issue here, and that is, that is the real question of sovereignty. And the acts of union in 1801 were absolutely clear, particularly on the 6th of the Act of Union, that there should be no impediment between trade, of any court sorts between trade between GB and Ireland. And it is absolutely clear, emphatically, there are impediments now. In fact, 50% of the EU inspections happen on a border which represents 0.0001% of the EU's GDP. It is absolutely ridiculous, and it's a complete breach of the Belfast Agreement. David Trimble, who um, we were very we being the Centre of Brexit Policy, which is the uh, think tank I've set up, which is a cross-party think tank, the Graham Stringer, uh, Sam Wilson, um, and others from different parties. And we've done a lot of work on this over the last year. And it goes right back to my first meeting with Monsieur Barnier and Sabina Veyon back in October 2018. It was brought to my attention by our then commissioner, um, Duke King, who, was, who had been the ambassador in Dublin. And I then got up to run the Northern Ireland office and worked very closely with him. And he absolutely saw the balanced view of issues to do with the island of Ireland. He was very concerned that the unionist voices are simply not being listened to or heard or sought out by the Commission. So I took David Trimble along, who was treated with huge respect, a uh, Nobel Prize winner you know, in France, was a, a massive deal. I very politely didn't point out to M. Barnier that uh, Cambridge, where I went, Trinity College alone has got more Nobel Prizes than the whole of France. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we discussed where the negotiations were going, and David very eloquently put forward the clear view that the agreement, of which he's the co-author of it, he cannot be questioned on the details of the agreement, made quite clear that the status of the people of Northern Ireland could not be changed without their consent. And we <clears throat> had a round about the war, right, talked things I've just touched on about the electronics. But I said, and we got into the issue of um, standard single market, Sabina Vail got quite agitated and said we were going to uh, invest with proper controls and we would pollute the single market. And I said, do not worry. If we sell to the United States of America, we will match their standards. We sell the people from China, we will match their standards. We sell into your single market once we're a third country. Don't worry, we will match your standards. How we get there is entirely up to us. We don't want you telling us how to do it, which is what you have been doing in a very heavy handed manner for 40 years. We will match those standards, and if we don't, we'll make them justiciable in our courts. We will be sovereign. And what's so tragic looking back? Barney was really interested in this and said, Well, we'll take this up. Uh, but, um, more powerful figures than him, I think, within the Commission um, squashed the idea. And we know that Selma's report reputed to have said that losing Northern Ireland is a price that the UK will have to pay for Brexit, which is a very shameful thing to say. And of course, all this talk that the only way of protecting the agreement, the Belfast Agreement, is to maintain the protocol, is proving to be absolute nonsense. It is a real threat to the agreement. 
David Trimble has worked with us, so we did a big paper last summer. Um, we did another one uh, in the spring, and David's done some pretty important articles. Um, Arch Times did uh, Washington Post, a very important intervention he made at the G7 when President Biden sat down for breakfast and before he looked at his waffles, there was an article in the Times by David Trimble pointing out that the protocol is really endangering the peace agreement. And this is an absolute fundamental matter. You cannot have citizens of our country under another jurisdiction and say we've left. So I'm afraid Brexit is a job nearly done. We should be very pleased what we have achieved. But David this morning talked about, you know, we, we're no longer PCJ. That's not true of Northern Ireland. Our country is sovereign again. Sovereign again. That is not true of Northern Ireland. So this has to be brought to a close. I, I voted in the early days for the protocol because I understood very clearly it's temporary. I always was told, and I did raise this with the part of the thing, had a lot of meetings obviously through all the drivers of the Brexit meetings, I was always told it'll get washed away. Don't worry, it'll get washed away by free trade agreement. Well it wasn't. John and I didn't vote for it. I think we are completely vindicated by where we are now, and it has to go. Otherwise, in my direct experience in Northern Ireland, there will be more and more damage done to the Northern Ireland economy, more and more damage done to social stability and very serious political instability. So it has to be done. Uh, Barry, if you want me to talk a little bit longer, there's a couple of other points I wouldn't like briefly making on, I'll be very brief now, on the benefits which sadly I don't think we're taking from Brexit. You know, I, I want us to take back control and run a dynamic, exciting, innovative economy. And I'm disappointed, bluntly, that we have not grabbed those opportunities. I'm also pleased to see some people benefiting. It's all this hoo-ha about truck drivers. Uh, I've, got, I've got several large haulings in my city. So I went to one about three weeks ago. And all those, all those guys were not very well remunerated. All those people in the red wall seats, they knew why they voted for Brexit. They knew perfectly well whenever they tried to get a fair reward for their, their labour, bang! Some agent would bring in 200 remains at a knockdown price because obviously wages here bought so much more back in Remain. So of course, happened was marvelous actually. The Remain economy, those other uh, catastrophically wrecked communist, ex communist economy, it had picked up. So it's less attractive coming from the UK. But what I think is brilliant is I, I went to a trucking firm a month ago. They'd given their hard working drivers a 10 cent pay rise. They're going to give them a further 9% pay rise on top of that. And they're going to give them a 1000 to £5,000 loyalty bonus. Isn't that great for them that they are being properly rewarded for their labour and weren't they right to vote for Brexit? <laughs> so, you may go with my other bit, which is regulation. Government can wreck the economy by taxation. And if you wreck the economy by regulation, taxation it confiscates your money, regulation it confiscates your time. I'm sure I don't want to steal John's thunder. I'm, John might think very well we like this, but on taxation, bluntly, I can't think of any economy that has ever been grown by increasing taxation. taxation I cannot, all, uh, well, I quote my main speech actually, uh, all taxation is bad, which is a very good, simple quote. And, the tragedy is, we're going to have to let the others know. It's always impossible to believe that we've. We, Dale, President Kennedy said, if you want to grow, if you want, to, if you want extra funds for public services, cut taxes. We should be cutting taxes to grow the cake and take a thinner slice of a bigger cake. It is absolutely extraordinary. We seem to have forgotten that lesson. And then there is regulation where you confiscate a company's time. And I spent, obviously, a lot of time on this when I was the DEFRA secretary. And there were just such wonderful opportunities, really brilliant opportunities for this. Firstly, for our farming and our food sector, and I always used to say, it used to annoy my uh, colleagues on the European Council, that Europe's heading to be the Museum of World Farming. The one figure I used to quote was that if France had the same technology 
of the same productivity as the United States, it would produce 6 million tonnes more maize, or corn as the Americans call it, worth 600 million pounds sterling. Or, very importantly, for the environmentalists becoming so powerful, could have freed up 500,000 hectares for forestry, recreation, whatever you want to do with it. But that's not possible because of the precautionary principle. And to caricature the precautionary principle, it basically says never do anything once. Could be dangerous. Don't get out of bed in the morning. Don't get out of bed in the morning. You might trip on the carpet. <laughs> Bang your head on the doorknob and break your neck falling downstairs. Stay in bed. Don't try it. And I was a real enthusiast of all the benefits. And I went to Rothenstein and it was a big scientific endeavor, but I actually spoke up for genetically modified organisms, which are going to be a huge success around the world, apart from Europe leading to massive increases in productivity, massive reduction in diesel use, massive reduction in compaction soils, massive environmental benefits. But we, we could do nothing within the uh, constraints of being in Europe. We got it talked about then there was a thing called the plantation principle. We never really got it there. Now we have a choice. And we made a promise at the election. We would go for gene editing. Now, this isn't anything that's going to frighten the Daily Mail. We're not going to put a rhinoceros gene in a blackberry. <laughs> gene editing. We're going to move genes around within a plant, as we have been doing since our Stone Age ancestors. But we're going to do it much more quickly and much more scientifically. And there's this wonderful um, concept, trial that they're doing often, so try going to go and see shortly. Taking a compound out of wheat, which means that when you burn your toast, it's not carcinogenic. And And if we go on with it, we could go into the next election saying, thanks to Brexit, we've not only had a spectacular gain on vaccines, which I think Tim said saved 40,000 lives. The theory should have kicked off our economy because the system had start. But we could say, your toast is now going to be safer thanks to Brexit. That's just one very simple idea. But the problem is, I get the feeling our establishment is here, cops with their shoulder. I don't know, what would they, what would they have done? Whoops, we, we don't want to get ahead of them. So, if you look at what we've done in genetically, it was a clear promise. We never say no, we never say no, but we never, ever, 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 ever say yes. So that yet another survey goes on. We could be getting on with this now, and with huge benefits to our farming, huge benefits to our future, and huge benefits to our health. Probably enough, probably enough, but I'm very happy to take questions. Oh, if you've not done by genetic, you probably haven't read your father's Guardian yet this week. I'm sure you're already the readers. I did a piece on it at the back. Thank you very much. <laughs>
James has been a powerful advocate for the case for leaving the European Union and how business can take full advantage of that withdrawal. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please welcome James Bartholomew. Like effect on right wing media hacks, <laughs> along with people who believe the USSR famine, brackets, so called Holodomor, Holodomor uh, was a genocide. Um, you can now buy t shirts that say literally a communist. You can even buy, as of uh, last month, uh, necklaces and earrings that say literally a communist. And these, you'll be glad to hear, are available in gold, rose gold, and silver. <laughs> the irony seems to be lost on them. <laughs> um, now, you may take these two isolated events as isolated, uh, even though they've got a lot of publicity. But we should also recall that the Labour Party was, until very recently, led by Jeremy Corbyn. And that Corbyn and his associate McDonnell have given talks in public with, thing, with posters behind of Marx, Engels, and others of, that, of the communist history. And Corbyn received 32.2% of the British vote. It is, he lost, of course, but there were still plenty of people who were willing to support such a man. Universities now are overwhelmingly dominated by left-wing tutors, of whom Ash Sarkar is but the tip of the iceberg. Um, but it goes further than that, it goes into schools and to the curriculum and in textbooks. And one textbook, a revision textbook I came across, a mainstream one available in your local Smiths, uh, talks about the collectivization of farms in the Soviet Union and uh, invites students to write about the pros and cons of the collectivization of farms. This was a process which resulted, either intentionally or unintentionally, in Ukraine alone in 3.9 million deaths by starvation. 
dramatized in the recent film, Mr. Jones. Um, the idea that this is a uh, small or insignificant movement is just not true, unfortunately. And I became particularly concerned about it, uh, feeling that I ought to do something about it, five or six years ago when I was in Budapest and visited a museum there called the House of Terror. Oh, has some of, some of you been there? Have yeah. you been there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, good. It's, um, it's a very powerful museum. Uh, very effective, rather well done. I've visited since then a lot of museums on this sort of history. Um, my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, she was rather overcome by how horrifying it was and um, had to be helped out. Uh, it is about, it is the place where it's actually set, is the, was the headquarters of the Nazis when they took over Budapest. And then subsequently, the same building was taken over by the Communist Secret Service. And in both cases, they were arranging arrests, interrogations, torture, and in the Soviet case, mass deportations to the, to the, the Gulag. Uh, in the basement, there are cells, uh, including one where, one is a cell where people were hanged, Another is a cell, where, which was a standing cell, so-called, where the prisoner had to stand all the time in a very, like a cupboard, a small cupboard, a thin cupboard. And if it could, you could tell by the, there was a gap where his feet were, if you could tell that he was leaning against the wall, um, then his, his legs would be wrapped with a truncheon until he stood up again. This is a, a terrible form of torture, but far from the worst that I've come across. Um, so, when I came out of that um, building, I thought, my children know nothing about this. Nothing at all. Um, after all, history isn't even compulsory at GCSE now. So many young people have no history at all to speak of. Those that do are getting a whitewashed version much of the time so far as they cover communism at all. And when they go to university, they're getting left-wing tutors such as Ash Sarkar. Now, people of, of my generation grew up with the Cold War, grew up with knowledge and understanding of communism, and in some cases, including mine, visited communist countries. I went through the Trans-Siberian Railway, through Moscow and uh, Budapest, and, um, and started in Peking on the Trans-Siberian. And we did, it wasn't a question of, do you think communism it hasn't worked? It was, it was a, extremely obvious that it hadn't worked. It was a humanitarian, economic disaster. And it was, there was no issue. And when the Berlin Wall all fell and the communist regimes uh, tumbled like dominoes, people like myself thought, well, that's it, that's over. 20th century had a great experiment in whether communism would work, and it's pretty obvious that it didn't. So we won't go there again. What a relief. What we didn't realize is that new generations would grow up not knowing. It wouldn't be a matter of their core knowledge, and it ought to be a matter of their core knowledge. It's things, the way things are going, it's not. And that has the consequence that they do not have the intellectual armory to say, oh, okay, it may sound great in theory, but it doesn't work. We can discuss why it doesn't work, but the empirical evidence again and again, when it's been tried over 20 times in 20 different countries, is that every time it ends in economic failure, torture, terror, and that we do not want to go there. So I thought that there ought to be a... Um, a museum such as the one in Budapest in London. Um, now that's, I didn't really intend to take it on doing this myself. I intended to call on a very rich friend and get him to hire somebody to do it. <laughs> However, he declined to give me the money and uh, so here I have been for the last five years, getting busier and busier. We now have an office and we've you know, got distinguished trustees such as Owen here himself and indeed Swedish supporters such as Tim, whom I'm most grateful. Um, the 
thing that really impressed me in the House of Terror was the videos. This, if you, you know, anybody can go into a museum with a little bit of doubt, a little bit of skepticism. But when you see videos of ordinary people saying, yes, I was arrested, I was put in a train and sent to, sent to a gulag, and uh, this is what happened to me, and my friend was beaten and died of a mixture of starvation and not being treated for the illness he had. When you see one person after another telling that story of you know, clearly very ordinary people, not actors or anything of that sort, any skepticism you have goes. This happened to real people, and it really did happen, and it was ghastly, and we do not want to go there again. And um, so I, it's been my priority from the beginning has been to record videos. So I have recorded videos of people in Hungary, people in Romania, people in Luckily, to be able to find two survivors of the Gulag, one in Moscow and one in, off the Portobello Road. Um, and uh, I talked to, had evidence from uh, a Cambodian. I mean, that was particularly harrowing. He kept on saying, I, I, I was lucky. What he meant was, he didn't die. Uh, he had a family of 11, of, only, of whom only three survived. And the last words of his mother to his sister were, can I have a little rice? before she died. I mean, this is a level of horror which people ought to know about, I think. So anyway, I've recorded many videos, and some of them are on the website in an edited form. Um, and uh, also, we, we've got a website, obviously, and there are briefs, which are sort of descriptions of various key events, such as the Katyn massacre, and the secret speech of Khrushchev, where he basically said that Stalin had killed people just out of the uh, desire to hold on to power, it was a, a complete condemnation of Stalin by somebody who had been his associate. Um, we have a few events, and in fact, one event we are having before the end of the year, if all goes well, will be an event in which Charles Udi, who is an expert on the Gulag, will talk, and it will be attended by Ivana Mashtak, who was in the Gulag in Kolyma, the top right-hand corner of the uh, Soviet Union where it is often minus 40 and where she had to go out in minus 40 and was punished by such things as um, being told to lie face down in the, in the snow, get up again, get down again, get up again, get down again. And um, so she experienced the full horror of it and she is in her 90s but nevertheless is game to come and uh, make an appearance and answer some questions. Um, we found the, the museum was unable to get charitable status, but we set up a second company called the Foundation for the History of Totalitarianism, which doesn't mention the C word and therefore is not considered political. And uh, this has started an essay prize, which has been, which is a way of getting to schools, as it were, by the back door. So first year we did an essay prize, this is for six formers. First year we did an essay prize on a man called Vito Kolecki, who's a Polish hero, he volunteered to go into Auschwitz and then later escaped and uh, joined the resistance against the communists. Uh, he was captured by them, tortured horribly for six months and then shot. Um, and so 370 students registered for this prize and 107 of them submitted essays and we had the award ceremony in the Polish embassy. Uh, so a number of Young people know about Vito Polecki, who otherwise wouldn't. And in fact, this school, which, is, which won, has used some of the prize money to do an annual Vito Polecki prize. So one hopes that these, you know, you spread, you put pebbles on the water and they spread. This year, we're getting many more entrants. We're already nearly up to the number of registrants that we had last year at a much earlier stage. So we're hoping to get at least double what we did before. The subject this year is the Stasi. So, hundreds of young people will learn what and how, uh, what Stasi was and how it behaved. Um, we also produce booklets. I have one here, which I've got a few spare, so if anybody would like one, I can give it. Um, I wrote a piece in The Spectator recently, and I've got a few copies on that about the experience of doing this work, which can seem rather strange at the time, because you tell me. People say, oh, what do you do when you meet them socially? You say, oh, I'm trying to make a museum of communist terror. <laughs> so, it just doesn't compute. Um, and uh, uh, eventually they think, oh, well, okay. Um, um, so, fine. Um, 
The ultimate idea is to create a, a physical museum. Uh, for that, we have to keep the office going, because this builds credibility. The more things we do, the more substance we have, the better we are able to raise the really big bucks, which is the, you know, the 60 million we need to create the museum. I am working on that. And we also buy artifacts in preparation for the museum. <coughs> so um, we've got a traveled car, if you know what that is. And uh, we've got many, many posters of various sorts. Um, we buy documents of various sorts, letters from, from uh, the Gulag or from wherever it may be. Uh, and in fact, next week I'm going to, to, uh, to uh, Czechia and hoping to buy a tank. That's going to be a, a big enterprise and <laughs> the donors will be nervously worrying that I'm going to come at them. And indeed I am if indeed the negotiations to buy the tank are successful. Um, so, um, I'm, I'm sorry this is way off what you were expecting to hear, but um, that's what I'm doing, and I may be nuts, but um, any support or interest you have is very welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, James, and I think that reminds us all of uh, how proud Margaret Thatcher was when the communist regime in Russia referred to her as the Iron Lady. And she certainly lived up to that reputation. And regrettably, we have no politicians in the UK now that one would describe as Iron. Uh, right, ladies and gentlemen, it now gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, one of the world's leading monetary analysts, Tim Condon. Tim began his career as a journalist working for the Times newspaper under the editorship of William Rees Mogg. That was followed by a distinguished career in the City of London, founding Lombard Street Research. He also advised the Chancellor of the Exchequer on monetary policy and was one of the so called wise men. In recent years, he has founded the Institution, the Institute of International Monetary Research at Buckingham University. The Institute has become a leading international authority on the conduct of monetary policy and a formidable critic of the monetary policies of the Federal Reserve in Washington. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please welcome Tim Congo. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, um, I'm going to try and. How long have I got now? Because we're really going to. Yeah, I um, think if you could do 10, 15 minutes, okay, that, well, that, that would be really good. I'm going to give one to ask questions. And, um, okay, um, well, the theme of the conference is, is freedom and conservatism. Um, I'm going to try and talk that title. But this is. Um, Robert, this is, is my presentation going to come up. Um, it is coming up. Very good. That's great. So um, we've got this phrase, levelling up. And I want to say one of the things that may be kind of blue sky thinking. There may be blue sky, as I said, the age of the stratosphere, why don't really mind about trying to challenge the... Um, we live in um, a nation, the two nations. Um, Disraeli has been quoted many times since he said that, used that phrase back in the 18th, 80s or 40s, but... As the top, and I'm, forget me, I say top and bottom, but the top 10% of the population, um, the wealthiest, um, they have private education. That about 7% of children go to um, public schools, they're called. Um, but they caught some grammar school boys, like, boys and girls like me. Um, so it's the 10%. And they have private education, and they have got private health and usually they don't really care about the state pension because they've got other assets. And in a way, you know, kind of like the uh, electorate in Victorian times, and okay, a very select group, but in most of the Victorian groups. And then there's the bottom 90%. And uh, they revere, most of them, the NHS. Uh, the children brought up to go to state schools and so on. And this goes on generation after generation because the top 
10%, they're better educated, and so on. So, the challenge of leveling up is really a very big one, all right? So what I want to do is, what's the purpose of the state? Now, I go back to the 19th century, and it's to protect property rights, um, it's to enforce the rule of law, it's defense. Look, those days are over. We live in mass democracies. And quite bluntly, what the state does is to redistribute. A lot of it, by the way, from that top 10% to the rest of the population. Um, top 10% um, have about um, 30%. I suppose they will come on in a second. Um, this may overstate the size of the state in Britain. Um, I did, in fact, use to. Uh, uh, I did use the highest possible level of normal GDP, to, but it's over 40% of GDP. Okay? The purpose of the state is to give those things that it must do, you know, like law and order and defense, and then, frankly, to the risk of Alright? I'm going to be very blunt about this. I don't really, myself, I'm not in favor of redistribution being part of what the state does, but that is what it does. It's just a fact. All right. And um, of this spending, about getting off half is actually outputs as such, and this is predominantly health education. And the other bit is transfer payments. These include, uh, obviously, pensions, social security, debt interest payments, and so on. So we're paying taxes uh, in order to receive these benefits. So, we said that the job of the state is these basic things and then to redistribute, but actually it's 40% of GDP. How good is the current arrangements for things that we think the state should do? Let's take it that um, this is uh, something, that, this conclusion comes from some work done um, after every budget, by the way, the Treasury produces a paper on how much the state redistributes income between households, and the redistribution between households from the top 30% to the bottom 70% actually, um, is um, predominantly, by the way, the 10% the bulk, the, the bulk of the redistribution, um, is about 18% um, of total household income. Household income isn't all of GDP, so something like 15% of GDP is redistributed. That's what the modern state does. So, we take it that the government should look after defense. We'll call that 2% of GDP. Historically, it's been much more than that at various times, but 2% or so at the moment. Let's take it that uh, Home Office and the police and all the rest of it, law courts, are 3% of GDP, which isn't far from reality. So those things, you know, like watchman role, 5% of GDP. 15% of GDP is redistributed. So these two essential functions should really take up 20% of GDP, and in fact it's 40%. The states have been inefficient. Taxes are much higher than they ought to be, because as I said, you know, we pay taxes, and then we receive benefits. Lots of people are in that situation. It's balmy. The question is balmy. Um, there are many things that could in fact be privately supplied, including health education, because let's be clear, there are large and important private sectors in health and education, and they go to the privileged top 10% of the population. All right. So how do you level up? This is my agenda. First thing, the most important thing, is privatize all of these things. Health, education, pension safety. All of us, not just the top 10%, should be able to pay teachers and so on, schools. If you're no good, you go to another, another school. You have to compete. Yeah. Uh, all of us should be able to pay our doctors, hospitals. Shouldn't have to queue for things. Shouldn't have to tell much of the bureaucrats. We should have our own savings, have independence of our own, having our own, owning our own assets. 
Now, you may ask, so then the stage is back to its night watchman role. Well, the truth is getting so cruel, it's going to be, you know, so bad for that 90% who look. You can raise taxes and give people vouchers that entitle them to a certain amount of money to spend in a school. All right? People. Working classes. You know, the Great Wall. They own houses. They own cars. They have to look after them. They have to insure them. It's very bureaucratic. They have to fill out forms. They're not stupid. Of course they can look after their children. And if they had to do so, I'm sure we'd get better outcomes from our schools. The NHS, let's just be clear, in terms of health outcomes, Britain is falling down the league table in Europe, and thank you, relative to the rest of the world. 1930s, Britain was way ahead of the rest of Europe in health standards, not now. Give people an entitlement to belong to a private health insurance scheme. Now, of course, you know, there are problems about adverse selection and so on, I realize that, and maybe there will be provisions for this, you must still sort of do something. But look, again, this doesn't have to be provided by the state. We can have both redistribution and private provision. All right? And that pays out the state pension altogether, and then set up a system be state-sponsored, state-sponsored, very redistributive, where we all pay some money to a scheme, and if you're in, say, the bottom 10% of the population, you pay your contributions, and the state trebles their value. As it paid for, it's paid again by the rich, actually. But we can have, I said, the state redistributes 15% of GDP. We can do all of that, I suggest, with this sort of thing, and have higher provision, and cut out the nonsenses of inefficient supply of all sorts of things by the state and also the nonsense of taxing people in order that they receive some benefits. Okay, how am I going for time? I think I'm all right. Um, look, um, I'm well aware that so this is blue sky thinking. Um, let's just be clear that um, there's another big phrase, you know, that phrase going around for leveling up. There's a phrase going around some years ago, by a chap called David Cameron, the big society. <laughs> I, 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 I sort of, um, by the way, that wasn't liberal, I didn't know. That was a way of, uh, just not saying anything, just like that. Look, I know this isn't going to happen. All I want to do is just to put the thoughts in your heads and maybe, can I just say, James, I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, Marx believed in a utopia where there was no private property. Private property is the key to freedom. Private property is the key to choice. Private property is the key to living in a society under the rule of law where we can make decisions for ourselves because we own it. So, my utopia, if I put it this way, is everything is private. The total opposite of Marx. And um, within that state, it is still possible to redistribute, and I hate to use these expressions, from the top 10% to the bottom 90%, and certainly we redistribute as much as 15% of GDP. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Tim, for that uh, groundbreaking um, presentation. And if Robert's here, I hope you'll be able to get that up on the website as soon as possible, uh, because we need to get that message to a wider audience and to be able to examine what uh, Tim has said in detail. You know, some people say to me, oh, what's the Bruges Group going to do in the future? Well, I think we're seeing today 
there's a massive unfinished business regarding the EU, but there are also other issues and changes that need to be made, which were, uh, Margaret Thatcher was a trailblazer, and the great advantage that the British group has is we have no competition. <laughs> Nobody is putting these sort of arguments before forward anymore. So there's a great gulf there that, that we need to bridge. Right. Now, today, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome the Right Honourable John Redwood, the Member of Parliament for Wokingham. John's contribution to public life has been immense, beginning with his service as head of Margaret Thatcher's policy unit at number 10 Downing Street. He's also been a cabinet minister, but above all else, he is and has been an outstanding parliamentarian. Forever ready to deploy his eloquence, ability, and considerable intellect in the national interest. Those powers of intellect and his sense of the national interest led him to vote against the high spend, high tax measures that the government recently put before Parliament. Regrettably, there were only nine other Conservatives that joined him. John, thank you for standing up for Conservative principles which are so important for many of us here today. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome an outstanding parliamentarian, the Right Honourable John Redwood MP. Mr Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to have helped select Boris Johnson as our leader, and I am proud that with the support of the Wokingham Association and their advice, Boris went on to call an election and call a halt to a rotten parliament, a parliament that was out to thwart the wishes of the British people, a parliament that was unbelievably anti-democratic. And when I look up... When I look out today at the Labour Party trying to drift from the far left of the road to the left of the road whilst having their own public civil war, or when I look out at the rump of the Liberal Democrat Party who are neither liberal nor democratic and are still wanting to thwart Brexit, or when I look out at the, the angry groups of SNPs uh, MPs who think every debate in Parliament should be about how they can split their part of the United Kingdom off in violation of a major referendum the Scottish people held not very long ago. I am mightily re relieved that we have a Conservative-led Parliament and a Conservative Government. But as your Chairman has had to point out, there are occasions when a man who is desperate to support our leader and our party has sometimes to say no. And there are times when we need to remind our leadership that we want a conservative government with conservative principles. And I've got news. <laughs> and I've got news for you. The people in the red wall seats didn't vote for Labour light. They voted for something different. The Brexit voters didn't vote for Labour light or more socialism. They voted for something different. And what I think they voted for, I call helping people on their personal journeys. They looked to the Conservative Party to lower the taxes so they got more of their own money to spend. They looked to the Conservative Party to allow entrepreneurs to keep more of their own money to invest in the future and to invest in jobs. They looked to the Conservative Party not to destroy the public schools but to lift the quality of the state schools so that they can compete. And they looked to the Conservative Party not to nationalise everything and not to take more and more money from the rich because a lot of people are not that jealous. It's not that people want to take the money from the rich. It's they want to be richer themselves. And that is what we do. <laughs> so let me take you to this little argument I've been having with some of our colleagues in government over national insurance increases 
and what we spend the money on. And let me just give you one or two facts, because I do find some of the people I discuss this with in Parliament don't do facts. And although that there are hundreds of pages of very good information about what everything costs and what we spend it on and all the rest of it, most parliamentary debates don't do numbers at all. We have endless MPs standing up saying there must be more money for health. But if you ask them what today's budget is, they haven't a clue. And I don't know about you, but I don't determine a budget is short of money until I know what it is and what it's buying and what it can't afford. And that is the debate we need to be having about the health budget. The health budget overall, public health generally, including the NHS, is said by the Treasury this year to be £230 billion. Pounds. And if you wanted hypothecated taxes, which I hear are now popular in some parts of the Treasury, uh, you would need to pay all of income tax, all of stamp duty, all of inheritance tax, all of capital gains tax, and that would buy you the health budget this year. So it's not a small portion of national insurance that will be the health budget, and I hope people aren't getting a misunderstanding about this, that you need all those wealth and income taxes to sustain the current health budget. Next number. That budget is £64 billion a year more than the budget was just before COVID. Now, I was very keen on them greatly increasing the spending to offset the economic damage being done by the counter COVID policies, and I was very keen for them to spend whatever it took on tackling COVID. And when you've got a pandemic and too many people are dying, yes, you just spend money. You don't argue about pennies or pounds or whatever. You get on with it. But what we should now do is to say, we boosted those budgets by 74 billion, uh, 64 billion a year to primarily deal with the pandemic. Where is that money going next? Because you don't need all those one-off costs every year, because you did all that. You put the vaccines in, you put the test and trace in, all those extra expenses. So with the famous 12 billion, when I was uh, briefed about this by ministers and their officials, along with other MPs, done on a cross-party party basis these days, I'm afraid I did say, what would I get if I voted for the 12 billion? And they said, oh, well, you know, the waiting lists have come down. So I said, oh, great, tell me how many the waiting lists are roughly going to come down by. What, what sort of guarantee? What's your offer? Oh, no, no, we can't promise they're going to come down. Uh, we can't say a number, no, but, you know, you need more money to bring the waiting list down. So I then say, well, look, your budget for the current year for test and trace is 15 billion for the year. And this isn't the setup year. And I said, I do notice quite a lot of people don't seem to be doing much testing and tracing anymore. Um, and couldn't we see what you could do for test and trace now it's all up and running for, say, 3 billion next year? And I got you your 12 billion, which you tell me might be helpful in getting the waiting list down, so do you really need the 12 billion for the national insurance? And didn't get a very clear answer to that one, so this was part of the background why I found it a bit difficult to vote for the idea that 12 billion was needed. So I, I say to Saj, you know, a friend of mine, wishing well, clever man, going in there as the new Secretary of State, Saj, ask some questions, challenge your chief executives, find out where all that money is going to. I don't know about you, ladies and gentlemen, but when I go shopping um, and say I've got 12 quid, I don't have 12 billion quid, but say I've got 12 quid, I don't go into the shop and put the 12 pounds on the counter and then say, that's yours. Uh, now, by the way, is there anything you'd like to give me for it? <laughs> and and they, they don't normally say, well, actually, not at the moment, John, but trust us, you know, there'll be... There'll be <laughs> There'll be something nice along. If you put your 12 quid on the counter, mate, you'll be all right. Uh, I call me old-fashioned, but I like to know what I'm getting, what the price is, and then I decide whether I like that shop and whether that's a good deal or not. And I think that's more of the approach we need from ministers running these great public services. They've got to say, yes, we don't deprive you money if it's going to save lives. We don't deprive you money if it's going to invent new treatments. We don't deprive you money if you're going to pay staff properly. We believe in all that. All this nonsense that we're the blue mean is no, we're not. I want people better paid. But I also want higher productivity and higher quality. Uh, I think you can do more with fewer people who are better trained and better motivated, and then other people can do other new things. You need 
the enterprise revolution. That's what we need. And so we need these ministers to take on the chief executives who have paid lots of money and say, right, what am I getting for my 200,000 a year from you, Mr. or Mrs. Chief Executive? Uh, and can I see just a few targets that are, uh, go to the heart of what we're trying to do? And can I make sure you're offering me value for money? Now, in, in pursuit of this, because um, obviously these debates go on, I'm very pleased that the government has said, yes, we, you're generally quite right. We, we need good value for money in our health service. And so Saj has appointed a former general to go in and identify waste. Let's call him the waste finder general. Uh, and I wish him well, you know, lovely. Uh, but it's going to take several months, and he's an outsider. And so I've got a bit of advice for Saj today. By all means, the general might come up with something, and it might be very helpful, but Saj, why don't you have a really serious meeting with your chief executives this week and challenge them on where the waste is that the waste finder general might find and say, let's not wait for the waste finder general to actually find it. You, the chief executives, should be motivated to get rid of it now and give me a target. Tell me what you're going to do. Might even give them a bonus. You know, if they came up with a billion of waste, that would be worth a decent bonus, wouldn't it? But the bonus would be conditional and you want to carry them with you. So, ladies and gentlemen, you've listened to an awful lot. I mustn't go on too long. But my final observation is this to the government. Trust in markets. Understand the role of price in bringing supply into line with demand. Understand that many of the things that people value and need in this country are not supplied by nationalised concerns, but are supplied by free enterprise. Promote free enterprise. Get out of the way. Cut the taxes. Don't overburden people. Get the freedoms of Brexit pulsing through the economy so that we can do in other fields what we just did with vaccines by cutting loose from the, the European experience and the European rules. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the Conservative way. The way you get the deficit down is to promote growth. The way you get more tax revenue rolling in to pay for your health service is cut the rates and get a bigger cake. The way you show people they were right to vote Brexit and Conservative is to help every one of us on our personal journeys. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be better off. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be better paid. But the Conservative message is it goes to those who work for it and it goes to those who trust the market and believe in enterprise.